Hello and welcome to episode one of the Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies podcast from the center of the same name at CUNY's Queens College in New York. I'm John Metaxas. I'm joined today by the center's director, Professor Gerasimos Katzen, and its assistant director, Dr. Maria Athanasopoulou. Professor Katzen is also chair of the Department of European Languages and Literature at Queens College, and Dr. Athanasopoulou is an adjunct professor of modern Greek. Today, we're going to discuss the subject of learning modern Greek. And professor and doctor, thank you for joining us and thank you for the work that you do at the Center in promoting and preserving Hellenism. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us today. Thanks. Well, we chose our topic today because we think it will intrigue anyone who has a desire to learn modern Greek or, like me, get better at it. And at the end of the podcast, we'll give you some information on how you may be able to audit a Greek language class at Queens College, even if you are not a student there. The Center for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies at Queens College coordinates with the Modern Greek Language Program there. Of course, it does so much more. And before we launch into our podcast topic, Professor Katzen, for those who are not familiar with the center, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. The, the center is here at, at Queens College to, to promote uh, the study and, and um, preservation of Hellenic culture. Um, we, we want to share Greek culture with the wider community and with our students on campus and to contribute to the cultural life of the university. Um, we do this in, in three ways. So the, the center was, was founded in 1974 by Professor Psomiadis, who, um, taking advantage of the of the ethnic studies movements in the in the nineteen seventies, um, decided that Greek should belong in the university too, and and but thought that it should be focused on later um, history, Byzantine and modern Greek, rather than just classics. And uh, so we serve our students by first of all. Um, running a, a modern Greek major and minor. So there's an academic aspect to the to the center's activities. Um, we also um, uh, foster academic research uh, through the collection of the Psomiadis Library. We have a large collection here of books on modern Greek culture and history. And um, we also publish a, an annual journal called the Journal of Modern Hellenism, which also promotes research in the field. And finally, we we uh, organize a series of events every year, um, both academic in terms of, say, um, academic subjects, lectures by professors and so forth, but also um, community-based events, student-based events that are um, designed to, to share the, the Greek culture with the wider community, both on campus and off. And I understand that this is the largest uh, Hellenic studies program in the country in terms of the number of students who have gone through it. Well, our proximity to to Astoria in particular and, and the large Greek community in Queens um, makes that the case. Um, I'm not sure that I would say it's the largest uh, because I don't have any any direct evidence that that's that's true. But but we are we do have a quite a large Greek student body on campus. All right, uh, Dr. Athanasopoulou, uh, let's launch into learning modern Greek. In, in your introductory Greek courses, how soon do you immerse your students in Greek, even if they're beginners with the language? Um, may I speak Greek? Well, well sure, let's immerse our, our <laughs> listeners in Greek from the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Το κλειδί λοιπόν για να μάθει κάποιος ελληνικά είναι να τον ενδιαφέρει η γλώσσα. Έτσι, να τον ενδιαφέρει η γλώσσα, η ιστορία και, και η κουλτούρα φυσικά της, της Ελλάδας. Γιατί έχω φοιτητές, έχω σπουδαστές που θέλουν να μάθουν ελληνικά, α, μόνο και μόνο για να εμβαθύνουν περισσότερο στην ελληνική κουλτούρα. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, we have we have lots of, of of heritage learners, of course, who want to to immerse themselves in the language in the language and the culture. But we also have lots of other students who who take Greek just as a language, who have no connection to Greece at all. So the main the main element there is is just the desire to learn. The desire. Now you mentioned heritage learners. Um, that's an interesting concept. Uh, some of our listeners may not know about that. Can you tell us what is a heritage learner and how is learning Greek different for a heritage learner than somebody who's just coming brand new to the language? Uh, σίγουρα οι, οι φοιτητές που, είναι, που γνωρίζουν από το σπίτι τους τα ελληνικά 
είναι, περισσότερο, ε, ε, είναι για αυτούς περισσότερο εύκολο να μάθουν τα ελληνικά, of course. Αλλά όμως έχουμε και φοιτητές οι οποίοι δεν έχουν καμία, κανένα άκουσμα στα ελληνικά και τους αρέσει, θέλουν να μάθουν. Ε, Right. So, uh, so a heritage learner is, is of course, is somebody of uh, the particular ethnic or linguistic group that that uh, th that's represented by the language. So, in this case, um, students of Greek heritage, um, people who have some contact with the language in the home or in their community, um, uh, and also have a kind of a cultural understanding of the of of things Greek, if you will. You know, they're exposed to Greek culture at home or in the church or, or in whatever community groups they belong to. Um, and this tends to give them a, a little bit of an, of an advantage over pure beginners and people who don't have any, any connection to Greece or, or the, language it's, uh, the language itself. I think the, the, the big difference between a heritage learner and a, and a non-heritage learner is that they already have a, they already have a head start in knowing how the language sounds, understanding something of what the culture is that's being represented by the language is like. And that helps a lot. Εγώ να προσθέσω και κάτι σε αυτό, ότι τα ιφιτιτές που δεν έχουν ακούσματα στα ελληνικά, όταν μιλάνε ελληνικά μετά, η προφορά τους είναι πολύ πιο ελληνική, γιατί το μόνο άκουσμα που έχουν είναι το δικό μου, που είμαι native speaker. Οπότε τα ελληνικά τους είναι πολύ πιο καθαρά από τους φοιτητές οι οποίοι ακούνε ε, μισά μισά, μισά ελληνικά, μισά αγγλικά από τους φοιτητές που έχουν μεγαλώσει εδώ. Είναι ενδιαφέρον αυτό από ε, γλωσσολογικής πλευράς. No, I think that's right, that, that heritage learners often bring with them some baggage too, that, that pure beginners don't have, as Maria suggests. Um, a pure beginner doesn't know what the language sounds like, and so, so if she teaches them pronunciation, They they learn it from a, of a from a native speaker. Um, Greek Americans such as myself often come with all sorts of baggage that they learned from their regional dialects. For example, I'm from Salt Lake City, and we we had certain kind of Greek Americanisms that don't appear in in the standard language. And okay. and we tend to speak Greeklish sometimes. I mean, we'll mix sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Americans forest. Americans forest. Έχει ενδιαφέρον γιατί. Εδώ στην, ε, που διδάσκω ακούω λέξεις που τις είχα ξεχασμένες στην Ελλάδα γιατί αυτές τις λέξεις τις κουβαλάνε οι φοιτητές μέσα από τους παππούδες τους που έχουν έρθει πριν από δεκαετίες yeah. οπότε έχει ενδιαφέρον το να λένε το παράθυρο, παραθύρι που το λέγαμε πάρα πολύ παλιά στην Ελλάδα yeah. τώρα το λένε παράθυρο ένα παράδειγμα αλλά έχει ενδιαφέρον που κουβαλάνε την ε, λεγόμενη ντοπιολαλιά τους έτσι, από το μέρος καταγωγής yeah. των δικών τους Yeah, they carry with them a lot of a lot of regionalisms that their either their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents brought with them from the old country when they emigrated. So this this creeps in in terms of uh, vocabulary that they've just learned, they've heard in their in their experiences uh, that have fallen out of usage in in contemporary standard modern Greek. So what's the first lesson like, and how quickly can somebody actually learn to say a few things in Greek? Mm -hmm. The, the first, uh, το πρώτο πρώτο που, που μιλάνε είναι το καλημέρα. Καλημέρα, τι κάνεις. Ε? Uh, τους αρέσει και Έλληνες και ε, μη Έλληνες. Τους αρέσει το καλημέρα, είναι εύκολο να το λένε. Καλημέρα, τι κάνεις, καλά, ευχαριστώ. Δηλαδή στο πρώτο semester που κάνουν τα ελληνικά, ε, σίγουρα θα μπορούν να ανταποκριθούν σε πολύ έτσι, μικρές ε, και σύντομε ε, συνομιλίε. Ε, τι κάνεις, που πήγες χτες, τι έκανες, τι έκανες το Σαββατοκύριακο. Ε, μπορούν να ανταποκριθούν σε αυτό. Και μετά σιγά σιγά... Φυσικά κρατάει πολλά χρόνια η εκμάθηση της γλώσσας, έτσι. Ε, από ένα χρόνο δι, τρι, μέχρι τρία χρόνια μπορείς να μιλάς καλά και φυσικά νομίζω κρατάει μια ζωή η εκμάθηση της γλώσσας. Ε, για να σημαίνει. Mm, I agree. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that first lesson, I mean, we always begin with very simple phrases, get the students to, to engage with real conversations. So, they start with by asking, how are you? And answering the question, how are you? What did you do today? What do you like? Very simple conversations to get to get students to to begin to experience actually 
normal sort of everyday kinds of, of contexts. Uh, and then you build the language, you know, slowly, you know, it takes a long time. Um, as Maria said, it, it, you know, after maybe two or three years of studying the language, you become relatively fluent. Um, but even in cases like myself, I mean, I have a PhD in, in Greek and uh, I'm still still learning every day. You know, it's a lifetime, it's kind of like a lifetime uh, uh, process. Um, I can't say that I know everything about Greek and I and I feel like I'm constantly learning new things. What makes uh, modern Greek difficult to learn for the average speaker of English? Ah, uh, well, um, <laughs> well, yeah, the grammar for sure, but to begin with, it's the alphabet. Um, so, well, you know, when we begin with a sort of a communicative method, the alphabet doesn't really play a role because we're, we're asking our students to, to listen to phrases, simple phrases and learn contexts. But once you start building the language and you start asking them to, to read in the language, then you begin having the, the issues of first the alphabet that you have to master the alphabet. You have to master um, the various very difficult diphthongs uh, yeah. that are associated with the alphabet so that you can pronounce words properly when you see them written on the page. Uh, so this is really the most difficult, the first difficult hump to, to get over for a student is, is um, learning how to read the language and pronounce Pronounce what you see on the page um, correctly. Και υπάρχει ένα γράμμα που δεν μπορούν να πούν σωστά. Το γάμα. Το γάμα. Γάμα, γάτα. <laughs> yes, and the, of course there are certain sounds in Greek that that don't exist in English, like the gamma, and mm -hmm. or you know some some uh, Americans have especially have trouble rolling their R's, and in Greek we roll the R a little bit. We say rhetoriki, um, right? <laughs> you see, it's it's more of a so it's it's a it's an R sound, but it's not exactly the R sound that we say in English, right? Just as you know, conversely, Greek speakers have, find it difficult to say to say English words with R in them. For example, the word party is very difficult for a Greek speaker to pronounce mm -hmm. the way Americans say it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a two-way street, of course. So you know, so. Those are the kinds of the real difficulties for an, for an English speaker is mastering the, the, uh, a strange alphabet and mastering strange sounds that they're not used to. Και κάτι άλλο, οι Ισπανόφωνοι είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να μιλάνε τα, τα ελληνικά γιατί έχουμε ίδιους ε, φθόγκους, ίδια γράμματα mm. και είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να τα λένε. Ε, έχω φοιτητέ που μιλάνε πολύ καθαρά γιατί ακριβώς έχουν το background ε, λατινογενή γλώσσα. Yeah, so the Spanish-speaking students yeah. can learn, can pronounce Greek much more easily than than mm -hmm. English-speaking students. Which oh, is absolutely! Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, in my experience too, uh, um, uh, I've you know I've spent summers studying Greek in Greece with international students, and the Spanish speakers always had the best accents. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for me, and I always felt felt uh, sort of ashamed of myself as a Greek American because they could always they could always tell that I was a Greek American. I have this American twang in my Greek that yeah. the Spanish speakers didn't have at all. They, they had perfect pronunciation. Uh. <laughs> right. Uh, well, as a newscaster, I had some difficulty reporting on the COVID crisis because when Omicron came out, I was pronouncing it in the Greek way and rolling my R's, but I think <laughs> some of the listeners could not process that and and, and and i and and i couldn't really bring myself to say omicron yeah. but that's right. sort of what we face in newscasting all the time is with words of foreign origin as to how you should pr pronounce them in english what's different about teaching uh, to today's students dr katzen oh what's different about teaching to today's students well that's a hard question to answer i think um I find that today's students don't have the 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 grammatical background that students had in the past. Um, uh, a long time ago, when I was a kid, and when you were a kid, we you know grammar was actually a subject that was taught in schools. But these days, you know, um, grade school, middle school, uh, even high school, they they don't really teach um, the specifics of grammar in English. So very often, I find that that. I'm teaching my students when we get to the grammar phase of, of a language course, I'm teaching my students first the grammar in English so that they can understand the concept and then 
I introduced the, the concept in Greek as well. Um, sometimes I, I mean, and this is this is not a lie. I mean, the, this is not an exaggeration. The I have been in cl in classrooms where I ask my students to give me a verb, and they ask me, um, Professor, what's a verb? Because they don't understand the. It's not that they don't know the words that for those action words, but they're not familiar with the grammatical terminology. So sometimes that gets in the way of of uh, a smooth teaching of grammatical concepts. Um, when you get to difficult concepts such as, you know, um, uh, the subjunctive, you know, then you really have to do a lot of legwork to to explain what that means and how it operates in the language. I remember when I took uh, modern Greek back in the 1970s, uh, Mr. Kladopoulos taught us the Katharevusa. And, <laughs> and, and I used to marvel when my father spoke Greek publicly and he would speak in the Katharevusa and it was so beautiful to listen to, but that's not taught anymore, is it? No, no, not at all. No. Um, in fact, since 1976, um, Katharevusa has, has, is no longer the official language of Greece. It used to be. But the they changed it after the junta fell in in seventy four, um, and they got rid of it, um, mainly because it caused it caused too much difficulty between, um, say, what the government was trying to tell the people and what the people could understand. And, and maybe for the uninitiated, we should tell people what the Catharevusa is. Well, Catharevusa was a was a an artificial form of the language actually that was developed by Greek intellectuals in the in the at the end of the 18th century, and then mainly in the 19th century after the, the origination of the Greek state um, as the official language of the country. Um, and it, it's tied to notions of nationalism because um, Greek nationalist ideology in those days um, insisted on a kind of a, a national purity and that extended to the language itself. So they wanted to, to um, eliminate any kind of foreign influences, especially Turkish influences in the language. Uh, and so they, when they encountered a foreign word that was in common usage that they wanted to get rid of, they would replace it with an ancient Greek word uh, wherever possible. And so it became a very kind of a stuffy, archaic, archaizing kind of a, a form of the language, which nobody in fact ever actually spoke because everybody still continued to speak modern demotic Greek instead. So everyday okay. spoken Greek. Και σίγουρα ήταν πολύ δύσκολο για τους μαθητές, οι φοιτητές, να γράφουν σε άλλη γλώσσα και να μιλάνε σε άλλη γλώσσα. Η καθημερινή γλώσσα ήταν διαφορετική από ότι ήταν αναγκανασμένοι να γράφουν. And so imagine if you're, if you're you know, a moderately well-educated person, uh, to pick up a newspaper and find a, a form of Greek in that newspaper that's practically incomprehensible hmm. because it's so archaic. You know what I mean? Uh, so there, there was always this conflict between everyday, the everyday speaker and the official language itself. Yeah. I'm speaking today with uh, Professor Gerasimus Katzen and uh, Dr. Maria Athanasopoulou of the Queens College Center for Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies. And we're discussing learning modern Greek. Uh, uh, Dr. Athanasopoulou, how much work does it take to become conversational in Greek and then take it to the next step of actually being able to read a Greek newspaper or a book in Greek? It's a little bit difficult. It needs more time, more practice, to read more practice, to read more practice, to read more practice, to newspaper, ephemerida, it's a little bit difficult to read θέλει τουλάχιστον τρία χρόνια σπουδών και πάνω, αλλά με συνεχή και καθημερινή επαφή με τη γλώσσα. Yeah, so yeah, probably on average three years with with very continuous um, diligent study, you could get to the level where you might be able to comfortably read a newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, that's optimistic, I would say. Um, <laughs> I think it. I think it takes longer, but you know, you can you can reach a very very functional level in the language within a very fairly short time, a okay. year or two, you can be quite functional. Και μην ξεχνάμε ότι έχουμε μια πολύ πλούσια γλώσσα. Το ίδιο πράγμα μπορούμε να το λέμε με πέντε διαφορετικές λέξεις. Είναι πολύ πλούσια η γλώσσα. Οπότε είναι και να μάθει κάποιος τη μία λέξη, θα χρειαστεί να μάθει και τις άλλες τρεις, τέσσερις, έτσι. Ναι. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the Greek, Greek, Greece has a very large and... and um, wonderful vocabulary so there are, there are myriad ways of saying the same thing in greek 
So you, by and large, are teaching young people, when I say young people in their late teens and early 20s, how to, how to speak Greek. And we know the brain progresses and its ability to learn languages diminishes. What about an older person coming to Greek for the first time or having some Greek and, and coming to it? Is it harder for them? Can they still do it? Um, η δική μου εμπειρία λέει ότι αυτοί οι άνθρωποι θέλουν περισσότερο να μάθουν. Βάζουν περισσότερο χρόνο γιατί το θέλουν πάρα πολύ. Έρχονται ε, εξειδικευμένα για να μάθουν, έχουν, έρχονται μόνο για να μάθουν. Οπότε βάζουν περισσότερο χρόνο και είναι πάρα πολύ καλοί φοιτητέ. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's that's the case that that an older person may be coming with different sets of motivations for learning Greek and maybe more motivated, in fact, than than an undergraduate student who's fulfilling a requirement for perhaps and and isn't that interested in the language. So yeah, uh, an older person can certainly um, uh, succeed, uh, and certainly. They, they might have even a better chance of succeeding quite quickly because they may have more time to study. They might be more motivated to devote themselves to the language uh, in ways that, say, undergraduates are not. Mm -hmm. Dr. Athanasopoulou, we understand there's another group that's very interested in learning Greek and that you teach a course at Stony Brook University just for yeah, them. Can yeah. you tell us about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, I am uh, also adjunct lecturer there and I, I am teaching uh, uh, modern Greek there. Ε, αλλά δημιούργησα ένα καινούριο μάθημα, ένα new course I created, um, um, Scientific and Medical Terminology, It's All Greek to Me. Γιατί... And, and, <laughs> yeah. and you're teaching that to uh, students, doctor students, medical doctor students? Yeah, medical and uh, και από τις άλλες επιστήμες and the, uh, the other scientific, uh, science, uh, the other students from science. Ε, και έχουν, έχει ενδιαφέρον η ανταπόκριση των φοιτητών αυτών γιατί ακριβώς έχουν το, θέλουν να πάνε να γίνουν ε, γιατροί ή έχουν το medical background ε, και τους ενδιαφέρει γιατί ε, εκτός από το, το terminology πώς προφέρεται μια λέξη έχει ενδιαφέρον γιατί τους νοιάζει να προφέρουν σωστά τη λέξη γιατί τους είναι πολύ δύσκολο στους μη ε, ομιλούντε ελληνικά, τους είναι πολύ δύσκολο να προφέρουν ε, μυοκάρδιο ή ε, άλλες λέξεις. Ε, αλλά ε, το ενδιαφέρον είναι ότι ε, επειδή εμπλουτίζω το μάθημα και με την αρχαία και με στοιχεία αρχαίας ιστορίας από την Ιπποκράτη και το Γαλινό, πώς ξεκίνησαν τα φάρμακα, πώς ξεκίνησε ε, όλη η ιστορία της ιατρικής, τους ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ και πραγματικά έχει μεγάλη ανταπόκριση το μάθημα αυτό στο Στόνιμπρουκ. It must have. How, how long did it take you to develop that course? Uh, is uh, just uh, um, the in a to a proti epafi in a san seminar. Ke meta snehizu na ke mathenu pio poli me pio poles leptomerias. Ala in a to entry in a i savogi gefto. That's a beginner course. Beginners, mm -hmm. ne, absolutely yeah. beginners. Like introductory course. Ne, mm -hmm. introductory seminar. Yeah. So, Professor Katz, and other than enrolling as a student at Queens College, are there any others who can take advantage of the opportunity uh, to learn Greek from you? And and what about doing that remotely? Oh, um, well, yes, certainly we have a senior auditor program. So uh, you mentioned um, older folks before. Um, uh, the, the program is designed for people who are um, 60 years or older. And... Um, They and, and as long as they have a high school diploma, they can they can enroll in a course at Queens College through the senior auditor program. Um, the fee is very minimal; it's eighty dollars per semester, so it's quite affordable for for a retired individual, for example. Um, and they can take up to eleven credits, which is which is three courses um, per semester under this program. Um, so, you know. It, Honestly, the main limitation for it is is um, sort of space in the classroom. If it's if a if a course is extremely full and and fully enrolled, the instructor may not want, wish to have an extra person to uh, who's just an auditor. Um, but in general, um, it's very very easy to accommodate a senior auditor in a in a course, um, and we're very happy to do it because it's a way that we can sort of give something back to the community. Um, People who are interested in that can certainly look at the Queens College website. Um, uh, there's information there, uh, or they can call the admission, admissions office at Queens College and get information about how to apply to be a senior auditor. And so that would really be any course, not just Greek language. 
Yeah, it applies to any course on campus, not not just the Greek language. And uh, and some of them are remote. Yes, we do offer a wide range of uh, these days of of online courses. Um, in Greek, for example, this semester we have two literature courses that are being taught online. We have one language course being taught online, uh, as well as I'm teaching a cinema course, which is which I'm doing as a hybrid course. So part it's partially uh, a, an online course and partially an in-person course. All right. Well, we we try to try, we try to make things uh, uh, give a variety of modes of of instruction so that students can have the sort of the easiest time fitting things into their schedules. Well, I, I'd like to uh, thank you both for joining us today. That's about it for today's podcast. And uh, for Gerasimus Katzen and uh, Maria Athanasopoulou, I'm John Metaxas. Thanks for listening and watching. And uh, we hope to be back sometime soon with the next episode of the Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies podcast. Thanks, John. Thanks. Kailisas <laughs> mera.